Hi everyone, I'm Charlotte and welcome back to Ex Situ, Operation Wallacea's new series of online lectures. This week we're very lucky to welcome Professor Nicola Marples from Trinity College in Dublin. Nicola is going to tell us about a piece of research that took place over two decades on our site in Indonesia. I'll hand over to Nicola now to tell us about this fascinating piece of research. So enjoy and come back and watch the rest of our series. Hello. I'm Nicola Marples and I'm sorry that you can't see my head talking um, but here's a picture of me just so you know what I look like. So today we're going to be talking about the principles of island biogeography in Sulawesi. In other words, how animals um, act when they get onto islands. Um, this work is done in co collaboration with Trinity College Dublin um, and Hulualeo University and Operation Wallacea. So we're from Trinity College uh, Dublin. Um, and we've been working with the other two organisations. This work wasn't done alone. We took lots and lots of students into the field provided for us by Operation Wallacea um, over the various years of the project. Um, and we are also very grateful to our collaborators who also came to work in the field with us some of the time and um, to the wonderful welcoming people of Indonesia who were fantastic hosts throughout all of this. So, our aims. Um, we were aiming to look at the processes of forming species, how species get formed when they get onto islands. We wanted to explore the taxonomy of the birds um, of the region using modern techniques. The area had been um, studied by the Victorians, but very few people since then um, of, of the, with using Western techniques. And so a lot of the um, modern techniques like genetics and um, morphological analysis and so on um, hadn't been done. We wanted to define which populations were species and which ones uh, were subspecies. So um, uh, to clarify the um, relationship between the different species. And we wanted to investigate the reasons for changes in isolated populations. So. To sum that up, really, our work was really looking for evolution in progress, the formation of new species on islands um, and how they come to change when they get to those islands. So why did we go to Indonesia? Well, partly because Operation Wallacea was supporting us out there, but Indonesia is a fantastic place to work. It's got the world's second highest level of biodiversity, which is a great start. And it's given us 17,000 islands to work with. Now, we didn't manage more than 13, um, but um, it, there's plenty of natural experiments out there, of different sizes of islands and different distances from the mainland and so on. There's lots of endemic birds there as well, um, more endemic birds than any other country. And in the Wallacea region, this little area in the middle, there's a kind of center for, for endemism. Now, endemism, endemic birds, mean birds that have evolved there. Um, if they they may have spread out to other places, but that is the, the center for where they evolve. Um, and quite often they haven't spread to anywhere else. So it's in fact the only place that they occur. Sulawesi supports 12 endemic bird genera. Now, um, its um, genus is one up from species. So there's lots of species in each genus. So 12 different genera is really impressive. So of all Indonesian endemic birds, an awful lot of them are threatened. Um, so of the total um, endemic birds, 61 are threatened species. Another 37 are vulnerable species, which is even worse. And it gets worse. 23 are endangered and a further 11 are critical. So it's really important for conservation to get a handle on what species are there and how the, each of those species are distributed and um, what they need to, to keep them alive. So conservation in this area is really vital. So why look for speciation on islands though? Why particularly um, islands rather than on the mainland? Well, before we can really approach that question, we need to think about where we were working first and what type of islands we had. So if you look at the little red box in the middle of this um, picture, that's our area of work. And if I blow that up, it looks like this with um, Sulawesi and um, Bhutan and Kabayana 
Muna and Wawoni being the main um, islands um, that we were working on, and then a, a little set of islands called the Wakatobi off to the right, which were tiny little islands. I, I've had to superimpose them on the original map because it didn't go far enough, but that's exactly where they sit and the, the appropriate size for them. So islands aren't all the same. Islands come into two categories. They're either continental, in other words, they're isolated pieces of the mainland. So either the water has come up and um, effectively made the land, the, the higher land into an island and cut it off from the mainland by the water being there. Alternatively, um, the um, islands may have broken off and, float and um, drifted away from the mainland um, on tectonic plates. But either way, they were once part of the mainland. So in our case, Muna, Bhutan, Cabrena, and Wawoni on this map um, are examples of that, that type of island, continental islands. And that's important because they start with a full ecology in place. All the plants are already there. The animals are already there. They've just become isolated, um, effectively in situ. They stay at home and suddenly they're on an island. The other sort of island is very different. It's an oceanic island. And oceanic, oceanic islands look like this. Um, they're either coral atolls or volcanoes where the land has come up from the sea and they've been created new and clean. So our Wakatobi Islands, the little ones off to the right on our map, are um, um, oceanic islands. They were never associated with the mainland. They were never attached to a mainland. Um, and that's important because they appear with no flora or fauna, no plants or animals at all on them. They're just bare pieces of rock initially, and over hundreds of thousands of years, they gradually acquire um, species. So all the species that you find on an oceanic island has got there from the mainland somehow, either by flying there or by floating on a log or by take, being taken by people or whatever. So they're very different um, uh, situations to begin with. Continental islands start with all our animals and plants. Oceanic islands start clean and have to gain them. Therefore, islands are really interesting evolutionary experiments. Both types of islands are, are cool for this reason, um, because they cause splits in the populations. What, uh, by either technique of, of the um, individuals getting there, they're no longer communicating with their mainland um, equivalents. They, they're no longer breeding with them. And that allows speciation to happen because speciation requires the separation of the population so that the animals don't interbreed. Now that can be in the same place, but most of the time it's this physical separation that starts it. The process goes like this. Here we have a mainland and on the right an island. The island is an oceanic island. It's just come up with nothing on it. The mainland has lots of species on it. Let's think of a, um, the mainland as having a species of bird that's green um, and it sets off from the mainland. Maybe there's a big storm and the storm blows it across um, to the island. OK, and then the storm stops. So there's no longer um, birds arriving on the island anymore. The island is separate from the mainland population. But the birds, the birds are the same color still. They're both green. Um, because nothing's changed. But over time, the colonizers of that island are going to change. They're gradually going to, I'm, I've um, described it with the change of color here, but they'll change in various ways. And we'll look at that, at that in a minute. Now, any birds flying back to the mainland are too different to interbreed. And so that process of, of them getting to an island and then becoming different and then not being able to interbreed and the, um, the effects that that has are what we're going to talk to, what, what I'm going to talk to you about in this lecture. I'm going to use examples um, from our own work in Indonesia. So there are three parts of the process and we'll look at each of these. There's first of all, what influences which species are going to get there? And then we're going to look at why the colonizers change. And then finally, we're going to look at what happens when they re-encounter their parent species back on the first island, on the first place. So getting to the island in the first place, what influences which species are going to get there? Now, first of all, there's a, um, a, a lot of this uh, subject area 
has come up with different rules with definite names like the distance rule. To some extent, they're hand-waving rules. They're not awfully convincing. And to some extent, they're quite useful for thinking about the problem. The distance rule is quite a strong one. It basically says, if your islands are a long way from the mainland, it's going to be harder to get there. So which species reach oceanic islands, the ones that are completely empty, is dictated by how easily um, they can get there. The first one is how far it is from the mainland. And you can see in the top picture, that's going to be an awful lot harder for a species to reach than any of the islands of the bottom picture. But also you need to think about the fact that not one that all species are not the same as each other. Insects and birds, our first two pictures reading from the left, can get there much more easily than mammals. So this dog and this tarsier are going to find it extremely difficult to get to the um, oceanic islands uh, at the top because they have to float on a log in reasonably large numbers in order to um, be able to get there and colonize. And it's very unlikely they'll survive the journey. Whereas the birds and the insects are going to get there much more readily. So different species are going to have a better chance of getting to, at colonizing new islands. Um, and close islands are going to have a better chance of getting a variety of animals. But what happens when they get there? We kind of have to see one more layer in this, um, which is, let's say that this bird, this pigeon on the picture, arrives at the island at the top. If he arrives alone, that's it, he's going to die there and he's not going to leave any kids because he, there's only one of him. Even if it's a her, it's unlikely that they will um, manage to breed. If on the other hand they arrive in a flock, then there's much greater chance. So immediately you can see that flocking animals or animals that travel around in groups have a better chance of colonizing islands than ones that travel on their own. Even if it arrives in a flock, and this is good news, the next question is, is there any food? On the picture at the top, there is nothing to eat. And so therefore, again, they're going to die out. That's not good enough. They need to have an ecology already in place, some food and some habitats and so on. They really need plants and insects and nesting sites and shelter in bad weather before a bird can colonize um, a, a new island. So. If all of that is in place, it's probable that they'll start a colony. If it isn't in place, then they'll die out and the island will not get that species. So the ecological complexity of the island matters critically, as well as how far away it is and what sort of species it is that's trying to get to it. The next thing that's uh, um, relevant to who is going to get there is called the species area relationship. And this says that the more habitats an island has, the more species it can hold. So a, a bigger, more complex island is going to have more species on it than a small, um, uh, simple island. So how many species are going to be is going to depend on how old the island is, so how long it's had for these um, species to happen to, to be flown to it or to get there somehow. It matters how big the island is, the bigger it is the better, and it matters how high the island reaches because altitude gives you lots of different habitats as you go up the mountain and so um, therefore the height of the island is going to hugely increase how many species it can hold. So the bigger, older, higher all increase the habitat diversity and so increase the number of species um, that can be held on that island. Now that species area relationship says that an island can support twice as many species with every 10 times increase in size. This is getting quite numerical, but it seems to work. It can double the number of species with every 10 times increase in size. And if we look at um, our islands again, the ones that we've been working on, um, I'll give you this map quite often that it basically is showing you Sulawesi at the top with Cabarena on the left and Bhutan on the right as our um, main um, co uh, continental islands. And they're um, uh, also quite big islands. And then the Wakatobi Island, Wanji Wanji, Kaladupa, Tamiya and Benonko leading downwards. If we t um, look at each of those, and the, the size and the distance from the mainland, we can actually check this species area relationship. 
So um, looking at this table, I've given you the size relative to the biggest one. So we've called a boot on the biggest and everything else is a proportion of its size. Then the distance from the mainland, just who's closest and who's further away, and the number of bird species we found on each island. So um, the, the bottom two, Arojo and um, Hoga, are tiny little dots, tiny little islands near, um, in Arojo's case, near Wanjuanji, and in Hoga's case, near Kalalupa. So they're um, the same sort of distance from the um, mainland as those two islands, um, but they're much, much smaller. So we can plot them on our, on our graph as well. What we're going to do is we're going to plot the size of the island against the number of species we found. So here is that plot. Um, now it's, it's log species and log area simply because otherwise we're plotting on a curve. It just makes the curve into a straight line. So the straight line going across this graph is the, um, what the theory says. So if the island rule is right, the, sorry, the um, uh, species area relationship is, is um, right, the 10 times rule, then they should lie along that line. And you can see each island does lie pretty close to that, that um, line. They're all slightly below it, and Wanji Wanji is quite a long way below it. That suggests to us that the habitat has been degraded in some way, and Wanji Wanji has a very degraded habitat in that it's lost almost all of its forest. But even allowing for the fact that most of the islands have a little bit of de uh, degradation due to the people that are living there cutting down a lot of the trees, nonetheless, it fit, fits the species area relationship surprisingly well, that the area of the island is predicting how many species we found on it. You also have to bear in mind that we were only there for a few weeks in, on each island and therefore may not have spotted all the species. So um, the, the uh, birds, so a few of the birds may have eluded us, and that also would bring us below the line. Okay, so enough about who can get there. Why do they change once they're there? Why do colonizers of islands change? There are at least five reasons why this is, is going on. Um, and effectively, um, each of them is making them change from the, the parent species, as we call it, the, the one that's found on the um, mainland, um, and makes it into a new species on the island. So those uh, reasons are founder effects, island rule, the fact that there are fewer predators, relaxing of sexual selection, and different, the fact that they're competing with different competitors than they would on the mainland. And we'll look at each of those in turn now. Okay, so starting with the first one, the founder effect. Founder effect is quite surprising and quite interesting. A small number of colonizers are unlikely to have the variation present in the parent population. So if you think about our original colonizers, let's say 20 of this pigeon that I've pictured here, arrive on an island, um, it's unlikely that those 20 pigeons would have all the variation available in the, all the genetic variation available in the parent population from the, from the uh, mainland. Simply because you've only taken 20 individuals, rare alleles are usually absent from a small population, whatever size that small population may be. Um, it's smaller than the mainland, it might, it, it's going to miss out on rare genetic diversity. On the other hand, let's imagine that one of our 20 pigeons in fact had a rare allele. It's, um, it happens to be, by, just by luck, carrying something rare. If it is present on our new population of 20 pigeons on the island, then it's suddenly much more common than it was on the mainland. So um, one pigeon happens to have a rare allele. Let's say that that rare allele is only present in one, um, one pigeon in, out of 20,000 on the mainland. All of a sudden, on the island, it's now present in one out of 20 pigeons, because there are only 20 pigeons, and we do happen to have one. So it's now a thousand times more common, simply because it's now in an isolated population. So both of those things, both the, the fact that you, you lose genetic diversity and the occasional rare allele is suddenly much more common, are called the founder effect, and they have a big effect on 
uh, the likelihood of um, finding odd things about um, the, the uh, island population. And if you're going to breed from those odd individuals, then you're going to perpetuate that strangeness. And that is in itself going to make them slightly different from the mainland population. A possible exa example of founder effect in our birds um, was found in the lemon-bellied white eye, um, which happens both on, which we, we found both on Busan and on those small islands, the Wakatobi Islands. This is a picture of the same species. You can see that the Wakatobi one looks quite different. It's much yellower, uh, yellower on the Wakatobi than on Busan. It's probably not ecologically useful to be slightly yellower. Um, what's probably happened is that the first colonizers happened to include a very pale, a very yellow bird, um, and they then bred, and for some reason the best breeder happened to be the yellower one for some other reason than its colour, and um, that could easily lead to the um, ones on the um, islands ending up um, with many more copies of the pale colour, um, and that's that um, pale colour spreading and the gene for the darker colour um, dying out. There is another explanation for, for this um, colour difference, which we'll come back to at the end, um, but it's, it's quite possible that it's just an accidental effect of the first colonisers happening to be pale. The second thing that makes islands different is called the island rule or Foster's rule. And this states that large animals on islands tend to get smaller. So an elephant arriving on an island is going to um, probably end up as a pygmy elephant. And small animals tend to get larger. So the shrew um, uh, on the mainland, um, when it gets to an island, is likely to evolve to become bigger. And we see this quite a lot. So the dodo at the bottom of the picture is just an enormous pigeon. Um, it's become a ground-dwelling pigeon, but it was just a huge pigeon, um, probably because it was isolated on Mauritius. And the giant tortoises, again, are just a very large version of a, of a small tortoise. So because they got to islands, they've changed size. Why would they do that? Well, there's a whole combination of reasons why they might change size. The fact that the island has less food um, is going to select against very large animals. So therefore, the, the, the huge things like elephants are likely to get smaller because you just can't get enough food um, if you're the biggest of the elephants that arrive. So you're going to end up selecting for the smaller and smaller elephants. The flip side of the coin is that the lack of predators, which we'll come back to shortly, lack of predators allow very small animals to get larger because they don't have to hide anymore. They don't have to protect themselves anymore, so they can um, become bigger and more obvious. Lack of competition between individuals means that animals can eat a wider range of foods. So it's best to be versatile, and an intermediate sized animal is more versatile in its um, range of foods. It can eat larger things than it um, could, could have if it was tiny. Um, and um, it doesn't need quite as much food as it would um, uh, have to eat if it was huge. So intermediate size is kind of um, selected for on island. We have lots of examples from our work of this. The ones I'll introduce you to um, are, if we just think of the species that we found on Cabayena and compare them to um, the ones we found on Busan, and here's our map again so you can find Cabayena and Busan, you see Cabayena is much smaller. Um, the birds we found on Cabayena um, and, and had enough to compare to the size of the ones on Bhutan, three species had got smaller and eight species had got larger. So they're going in both directions. Some are getting smaller, some are getting larger. There was no pattern overall. It's just luck which way they start to drift and um, which way uh, they end up for intermediate um, species, intermediate size species, and the very small ones tended to get bigger and the very big ones tended to get smaller. Similarly on the Wakatobi, so our little collection of islands to the right there, um, grey-sided flowerpeckers got bigger 
compared to those on Bhutan Boot, um, or mainland. Um, but the lemon-bellied white eyes got smaller on the Wakatobi than on Bhutan or mainland. Now, um, lemon-bellied white eyes are quite a small bird, so there's a special reason why they got smaller, which we'll come back to shortly. But let's look at the grey-sided flowerpeckers first. So these, um, we're comparing Bhutan Island, mainland Sulawesi, so the, you can just see the leg of it at the, to the top of, of the map, um, and compare those to the Wak ones on the Wakatobi. So um, this is a, a plot of the, the weight against the wing length, so um, we can see whether their wings are getting shorter and also whether their overall size of the weight is getting smaller. Uh, the red dots are Bhutan and the um, purple squares are Sulawesi, and you can see there's no difference between those populations, they're, they're kind of intermingled. But if we plot the Wakatobi um, gray sided flowerpeckers on, you can see they're way away. They're both heavier because they're higher up the graph and their wing length is a lot longer um, because they're further to the right. So grey sided flowerpeckers are significantly bigger in the Wakatobi than on Bhutan or Sulawesi. So they're definitely. The opposite was also found lemon bellied white eyes were smaller on the Wakatobi than on Kabayena. Um, and so the blue um, circles here are the Wakatobi um, lemon bellies and the green triangles are the Cabayana ones. So we're getting difference in both directions. The next thing that changes when you get on an island, so size is going to change, in, but you don't know which direction. The next thing that happens is um, that the species will be selected um, be, uh, in, a, in, a, in conditions where there's very few predators. There's a relaxation of predator pressure. The populations on newer islands tend to escape predator pressure because there are fewer predators um, who will have arrived. So predators tend to be bigger, it's harder for them to travel, um, and particularly land predators are going to be, find it very difficult to get to, to islands. Um, so fewer of them will get there in the first place. But also predators have really small populations. You, you have a triangle of, of numbers of, of species in ecology with predators at the top with very small numbers eating a larger number of, prey, of, of individuals in the prey um, species level. So predators' populations are always small, which means that if they, if they go up and down at all, there's, there's a, a danger that they'll go down to zero and not be able to get up again. So they go extinct much more easily and tend to disappear from the island, even if any of them ever do get there. And that means that islands tend to have very few predators, particularly not ground predators. So that means that the selection pressures present are different from on the mainland, and you find a loss of predator defences. Um, and particularly in birds, you find a loss of flight. They lose their wings. So this um, cormorant in the middle um, is you can see that he has tiny little wings. He's losing them. Lo he's, he's, he's evolving smaller and smaller wings. In New Zealand, there's no natural land predators at all. Now we've brought some in in recent years, um, uh, since Victorian times or so, but before that, and all the way through the kind of um, early evolution of the animals there, there were no land predators. And the striking thing about the birds of, uh, of uh, New Zealand is that a quarter of them are flightless. So there's kakapo at the bottom. No, I can't remember what it's called. Um, at the bottom, it'll come back to me, um, are flightless. They, they can't fly at all. So he can't open his wings and fly away like a normal chicken-shaped thing would be able to do. Um, they don't have wings. Takahe is what it is. But why would you lose your wings? Well, first of all, it's expensive to grow something that you're not going to use. So um, it simply saves on resources if you don't waste it on wings that you don't need. But also, there's another aspect of flightlessness when you're on an island, particularly on a distant island that's a long way from the, from the mainland. And that is that flying off the island is almost certainly going to kill you. 
So if you're flying around and a big um, storm comes along and blows you off the island, then you're likely to die. You're very unlikely to get anywhere good. So not flying around and staying safely on the ground is very heavily um, selected for an island of birds. Another thing about relaxed predator pressure is that they don't need to be as afraid of coming to the ground. Um, so you find an increase in boldness. So some species do still fly, um, but are much less timid and quite often feed on the ground when they wouldn't on the mainland. So this um, top picture is of a lesser short-tailed bat, um, again from New Zealand, and it feeds more on the for forest floor than any other bat in the world. So it comes down to the forest floor to feed. Most bats would not do that. But because there's no ground predators, it's not been selected against. In fact, it's a new source of food, so they do it. Even in our own work, we found that the boat the, the, on the Wakatobi, so there's small islands a long way from anyone else, um, the sunbirds were really very noticeable in the fact that they would come very often to the ground. You'd see them hopping around on the ground, which you wouldn't see in the rest of the um, islands. And it allowed us, they also allowed us to get much closer than the ones on Bhutan or mainland Sulawesi would allow. So they were um, much more confiding um, in, in, in showed an increase in boldness. The next thing that changes, or another thing that changes, is that there's less intense sexual selection. On islands, the birds tend to reduce their courtship displays and also become more variable in their, in their colour pattern, in their, their signals, than, um, uh, than they do on the mainland. And those signals are called species-specific signals. They're signals saying, I am this species. Um, so mate with me if you're also this species. But because there's fewer closely related species present, then there's less danger of confusing who you should mate with, less risk of hybridization, and so they don't need to be as clear about those signals. So in our um, uh, particular example, this is a sunbird, and I know that this picture is a, a um, sunbird from the mainland um, because he looks like he does with an eye stripe above his eye and a um, stripe going down from his bill. There's only one species of sunbird, which is what he is, present on the Wakatobi. There are four species on the mainland. So on the Wakatobi, he doesn't need to be at all as clear with his signalling. And indeed, he's lost those eye stripes completely. So the same species from the Wakatobi is the bottom picture. And you can see there's no stripe, stripes across his eyes at all um, because he doesn't need to be so, so obviously um, this species of sunbird because there is only one species of sunbird. The final thing that's different about being on an island is that you tend to have different competitors. So because island communities are less biodiverse, um, in other words, they have fewer species, there's usually less competition between those species. On the mainland, what happens is if there's two species that are very similar to each other, then they will quite often undergo what's called resource partitioning. And it's like they've agreed, you eat the big things, I'll eat the small things. Or you eat the top of the tree, I'll eat the bottom of the tree. And they haven't agreed that, but they've simply evolved to specialise in one part of the food type. So one may specialise in small food to avoid competing with another species that specialises in, for instance, a larger one. When they get to an island, that other competitor may not be present. So let's say that we're the species that eats the small food. As soon as we get to the island, the big, big food species is gone. So actually, I could eat the big food now, um, or I could eat both sizes of food. Both are available. So on the island, the competition is different and usually less between species. And so therefore, um, the species can eat a, a wider diversity of food. An example of this from our own work is this grey-sided flower pecker. That's a picture um, there. On the Wakatobi, it's, not only is it um, bigger itself, but also it's got a larger bill than on the mainland. And the bill size doesn't need to change with the rest of the body size. 
If it does change, it's indicating a change in diet. So again, if we look at um, our grey-sided uh, gray flower peckers with wing length along the bottom again, but now we've got bill length up the side, um, then we can look at it on Bhutan and Sulawesi, the mainland sites, they're not different from each other um, and they're um, intermingled. But if you look at the Wakatobis, um, the males are way off to the side. Now, in both of these grey-sided flower pecker graphs, I plotted the males. If you plot the females, then the, 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 um, you see the same pattern. But males and females are different from each other, so you have to plot them separately. But the bill length here is clearly different. So the grey-sided flower peckers have changed their diet when they got to the small islands of the Wakatobi. And that's all good and, and proper and how it usually is, but sometimes on the island, islands, the islands are too small for the, for the resource partitioning that was agreed on the mainland, if you like, to happen, because the island doesn't have enough distinction between the two habitats. So if they separate into different habitats, then it may, they may run into a problem on the island. And an example of this is our collared and sacred kingfishers. So it can, um, this problem can lead to increased competition, which has been avoided on the mainland. So in our, um, our case, the, on the mainland, the collared kingfisher, the guy on the top, lives inland, and the sacred kingfisher, the one on the bottom with the kind of more uh, ruddy areas that, that are white in the collared guy, um, the, the sacred kingfisher lives on the beach. So they never come into competition because they're eating in completely different places. And living in completely different places. When you get to the, to the Wakatobi, the islands are much smaller, so there's hardly any inland space. So both species are effectively coastal, and you find collared kingfishers on the beach along with the sacred kingfishers. And at that point, they're of course beginning to compete. In response to that competition, which is not there on the mainland, the um, collared kingfisher has changed and got much bigger on the um, island, simply so that it, compete more, it can compete more effectively against the sacred kingfisher. So if you look at these two graphs, we've just um, got um, wing length um, plotted this time separately from head and bill, but um, the wing length is showing you that on the Wakatobi, the blue column, the, the um, collared kingfisher is much bigger than it is when it's an, on Bhutan or, Wakato or um, Sulawesi. And again, the head and bill is much larger in the, on the Wakatobi than um, when the collared kingfisher is on Sulawesi or Bhutan. So they're responding to the competition um, by evolving to be noticeably bigger. OK, so all of those things are reasons why our island species has changed compared to our mainland species. What's going to happen when those separated species encounter each other again? When it's been isolated on its island long enough to change um, by all the processes we've discussed, one day there may be a storm going in the other direction and it goes back to the mainland. So here it goes back to the mainland. What's going to happen? Well, it's going to meet the parental, the, the parent population, the original species from which it evolved but it's now very noticeably different. The one thing that may happen is that the female of the parent, parent species may not recognize the island male as a potential mate. He may just be too different for her to believe that he's the same species um, and therefore refuse to mate with him. Alternatively, she may not be too fussy and may um, allow them, him to breed. And so you're going to form hybrids between the two putative species. Now, hybrids are usually detrimental, so any adaptations that, that avoid hybridization are favoured. So even if she's finding it hard to know whether he's her species or the island species, um, there's going to be pressure for her to become better at distinguishing. So now sexual selection is going on for clear signals. So on the island, we said the signals could get a little bit lax. Now we need really clear signaling. Either I'm an island species or I'm the mainland species. And that leads to exaggeration of those signals which distinguish the species. This is called character displacement. 
Um, and it's especially related to breeding to make the signal stronger to prevent hybridization, but you can get character displacement of other signals too. Where two species meet is called the hybrid zone because the, that's where the hybridization is likely to happen. They're, they're likely to interbreed and form hybrids. So they usually plot it like this um, with a character. In this case, I put yellowness going upwards um, and um, sp a spatial um, indicator along the bottom. So here we have um, species that we met earlier, the lemon-bellied white eye. I said on the islands were much yellower than on the mainland. So um, uh, uh, at the bottom of, of the graph on the left, um, you can see that the normal color for the island species is yellower than um, the extreme right, um, uh, which shows the normal color for the mainland species. So outside the hybrid zone, they're already a little bit different. But what you can see is that when they get inside the hybrid zone, where hybridization is possible, suddenly they change into more extreme versions of those differences. So in the hybrid zone, the island birds will become yellower still, and the mainland birds will become greener still. And that difference, that change from the, what the mainland species does outside the hybrid zone to what it does inside is called a character displacement. And similarly, from the, what the island species does outside the hybrid zone to what it does inside the hybrid zone, that difference is character displacement. They've changed the character to emphasize the difference that was already there between the two species. And that is our other explanation for why the Wakatobi white eyes, the ones on the little islands, are so yellow. It may be that they've evolved to be clearly distinguishable, not actually from the mainland species, but from another um, white eye species that is present on the islands, which is called the Wanji Wanji white eye, which I've got a picture of in the bottom here. So it could be that their, their, the character displacement is causing them to be more extreme in a direction that they were already taking by chance. Okay, so in summary, the species on the islands are influenced, um, but, so who gets there is influenced by um, some uh, factors, the distance rule and the species area relationship. Once they're there, they're going to change because of five different processes that we've talked about. And after re-encounter, once they get back home or back to the original mainland uh, population, it's likely that they'll start showing character displacement to increase those differences or the visibility of them to prevent hybridization. And even on our little study, um, we found lots and lots of those processes. And because we can, we can find the processes, we can start looking at how um, they affect the populations and to what extent uh, which processes work when um, and how the different species differ in their, um, the effect of each of those processes. So we really can study the process of evolution as it's happening. So just to finish up, for 21 years of entertainment, the 13 islands, 23 different sites that we visited, eight expeditions, more than 40 project students, three PhDs, hundreds of acts of welcome, and thousands of bird encounters. I'd like to give a huge thank you to the people of Indonesia and also to our collaborators, um, well, to Trinity College for supporting us, um, but also the University of Hilo and to Operation Wallacea. If you have any questions about any of this, I'd be delighted to have a chat to you um, when the um, uh, decreed time is uh, has arrived. I'll speak to you then. Goodbye.